So I've been working with the new depth prepass in Bevy 0.10, and this is going to be a video about what I've learned so far. First of all, what we have here is a shield made of hexagons that is using the depth prepass to draw an intersection on the floor and an intersection on the wall, and then a Fresnel effect to get the outer edge on the top left of the circle. So if I hit space here, it's going to be a little bit hard to see because Bevy uses a, I wanna call it a reverse Z infinite depth. So basically what happens is the near frame or the near pane of the camera view is one, and then the far pane of the camera view is zero. So that's why you see at the bottom closer to the camera or on the top right edge of the wall here, you see brighter colors because they're closer to one, they're closer to the near, near edge of the camera before things start to clip off. And then the background where we have nothing or even just the plane as it gets further away from the camera gets darker and darker and darker. But these numbers are still fairly small in my understanding. So it's something like between one and zero. This image that you're looking at is the depth buffer. The depth texture is called quite a few different things. It's basically everything that you can view in a scene where if you threw a rock at it, it would hit something. So if we go back to the actual scene, you can see that there's this like shield force field kind of thing around Ferris, but the floor is solid and the wall is solid and Ferris is solid. So when we go to the depth buffer, you don't see the shield because it's uh, alpha blended. So the depth buffer, first of all, only provides data for the depth at a particular pixel if the material that you're using is not alpha blended, it's not transparent. So that's why we get the floor, the wall, and Ferris. Now we can also see the normal buffer. So here we've got the floor is green. So if you think about this in terms of RGB, right, RGBA or something like that, then R is zero, G is one, and B is zero. So what we've got is a plane where the normal, the arrow coming out of it, is pointed up in the Y direction. So if you think about RGB, X, Y, Z, overlay those two things together, G and Y are in the same position. So if G or Y are one, if we're pointing in a completely vertical direction with a normal, what you get is pure green. And you can see what it looks like to be a little bit different on Ferris, who has a bunch of different normals based on where you are on the mesh. Now we're not really using the normal buffer here. I just wanted to show it because it is part of the debug script that is included in the shader prepass example. And if we look at the actual shader prepass example in the Bevy repo, you can see the scene here where the right two boxes have some different kinds of transparency masking and things like that. And the cube is physical and the floor is physical. So what we end up seeing is the cube, the floor, and the masked parts of the second cube, but nothing for the transparency on the right. Same thing for the normals. And this hit space to view the depth buffer and whatnot is the debug tool that I've taken and used in the shield example over here. So if we think about this on the left, we've got our scene, which is being animated in different ways with different materials. There's a material on the sort of shield itself. There's materials on the floor and the walls that are standard materials. And then there's some standard material on the Ferris 3D model. And the depth texture comes in as a texture or as a PNG or however you want to think about that if you're not familiar with shaders. It basically is something that we can sample at a specific XY point on the screen and we can tell from the color of it here how far away it is from the camera. And both the depth and the normal uh, passes are pre-passes. So we get to use them in our custom materials. So here's the system that's responsible for changing that. There's a pre-pass output material that we apply to basically a 2D mesh, a box. That box is just a quad that sits directly in front of the camera and covers the whole screen. Then we've run our system. If we hit space, we see one of the other ones. We see the depth, normal or regular. And the pre-pass is not enabled on this because the quad is sitting right in front of our screens. So we're able to remove the pre-pass processing from anything in our scene that we want to on a per material basis. So because we've got this like pre-pass output material, we can turn that off for the quad that's just right in front of the camera, which is really good for us because we need to see through that to see the, the actual scene. So if we look at the WGSL script for that, maybe make this a little bit bigger, uh, we can see the settings that are getting passed in with regular bindings. If you've worked with the shaders before, this should look fairly familiar. And the two new things here are pre-pass depth and pre-pass normal. So if we aren't supposed to show the depth or the normals, 
then what we get back is just transparency. So a VEC four of zeros, right? That means the quad right in the middle of the camera is showing our scene. And it's showing our scene because the quad is just fully transparent. It has an alpha of zero. There's no color. There's, there's nothing to show. If we hit space, we see the depth buffer. And we can access the depth buffer using the frag coord, which is kind of the position of the spot that we're rendering, and the sample index. Now, I don't have a good explanation for sample index, so that's something I need to look into a little bit more. But I do know that for the position, for this pre-pass depth texture, it only uses the X and the Y coordinates. So basically, we are provided this utility function that lives in a WGSL script inside of Bevy that allows us, if we've constructed this pre-pass depth texture, to access that in our shaders in the main pass. So this image that you're seeing on the left is what we're accessing saying when we access the XY value with this prepass depth function. And it'll give us back a single F32 for that number for the depth from the camera. So remember, if you're not used to shaders, that the coloring here is that F32 value. So you can see it being lighter towards the camera and darker towards the back because we started the camera at one and we go towards zero away from the camera. Similarly, we have this prepass normal, but this video isn't really about normals. It's about depth buffers. So we're gonna continue from here. So that brings us to our custom material, right? The material that we're applying to the sphere to the sh uh, shield to the shader and we also on our custom material have the prepass disabled because we don't want it included in the depth buffer we'll get to why in a second in this case what's happening is we're using bevy asset loader to load in two glbs one for the sphere one for the hex shield and one for ferris the impl of material for custom material is pretty basic as far as materials go it uses a fragment shader and a vertex shader from our script we apply the alpha mode that we've passed in and the really important part for the back side, for the uh, part to the right of Ferris, if you're facing the same way Ferris is, on the back side of our sphere, to be able to see that, we need to set the cull mode to none. Now I'm using an alpha mode of blend here. There's a bunch of new alpha modes in Bevy these days. There's add and multiply and things like that. Um, my color, because this is a thing that I worked on previously, my color was set up to do alpha mode blend because that's what existed pre 0.10. But I'll probably change this to additive in the future because I think that that provides a better look. Now it's really important to note that on the material for the hex sphere that we've loaded, we have not shadow caster. If we don't have this, then the sphere itself will cast a shadow and it'll look a little bit weird for what we want here. We do have a directional light in the scene so you can see the glint off of Ferris. It's going through the hex shield and hitting Ferris. It's lighting up everything we have here. So of course we have to set our camera correctly for this. I've set it up with both the depth prepass and the normal prepass, which are just components that you add to the camera 3D bundle entity. I've also set it up with Bloom. Now for Bloom to work, we have to set the Bloom settings and we also have to set HDR to true to make it so that any numbers above one become HDRE. <laughs> Basically what that means is that uh, Bloom will cause a bit of light to be coming off for things that are over one. And then I've got a camera controller that I've been using for a while. I think uh, Griffin originally built this. It's in this same repo. So we've got a light in the scene. We've got a PBR bundle, which will give us a standard material. Uh, we create that from a color. So the bottom and the, the floor and the wall are white technically, but because of the lighting, they don't look white. One is a plane that's just on the ground. And one is a plane that's rotated using a quaternion on the Z axis. So that's why we get the wall. And that's pretty much it for the rest code. Uh, it's If you've worked with materials before, it's not that bad to add in the depth prepass on the camera and then access it, right? There's nothing special you have to do in your material if you want to access the depth buffer. You just have to make sure that you set your alpha mode and you set for the material or any materials in the scene that you want the prepass enabled or disabled for, uh, either to enable it or disable it. Now that brings us to our shader. So this contains our vertex shader and our fragment shader. Vertex shader responsible again for positions of the vertices in this sphere. So that's the vertices that map out each of these hexagons. I've already talked about the logic for this little thing that's going around the circle that is modifying the vertex position of each of these hexagon vertices. So I'll link that video in the description if you're interested. Basically it's this code turns into a position diff that we also add to the vertex output. And then we use that diff and that position as the position that the uh, vertices should be in the world rather than using the default. Everything else in the vertex shader is the default vertex shader, which brings us to the fragment. Now the fragment is the really interesting part here, and I'm not gonna go through it from top to bottom. I'm gonna call out the fact that we're using prepass depth like we just talked about with the frag coord and the sample index, which gives us the depth sort of number, right? And then we take frag coord.z and we subtract the depth. Now, 
the reason we didn't want the sphere included in the depth prepass is for this reason specifically. The depth of a specific pixel on the screen, so like, I don't know, this one right here where my mouse is, is not the position of where the sphere is. We want the position of where the floor is or whatever's behind it, right? Because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to figure out where on the sphere is it almost exactly as close to zero or as close to the same value as the floor, right? So on the edge here, the sphere and the floor are in the exact same spot. So frag z is on the sphere and depth is on the floor. So if those two numbers are zero, then we want to start drawing a little pixel here, right? We want to we want to put some color there. Now these numbers are going to be very small, <laughs> of course. We're talking about like zero and up, right? And the depth numbers, as we've talked about, are numbers between like zero and one. So if you've got like 0.5, let's say, and you've got 0.51, then you're going to have a difference of like 0 0.01. So to modulate that a little bit, we multiply that by 100, which shouldn't matter that much. And then we invert it using one minus, and we offset that a bit to get the extra pixels on the bottom of our sphere. This particular line of code I got from Ice Sentry, who also did the force field in the Bevy 0.10 blog post, which I'm showing right now on screen, if I remember to do that. <laughs> but basically the whole set of this effect is we want to be able to detect when the circle is colliding with something. And then as we move away from being close to the same depth number on the sphere and the floor or whatever we're colliding with, we want to reduce the alpha of that color. The alpha in this case, because I'm using blend mode. If you were using add or something, you might do something different. So that's how you can take the depth buffer and use it against the view depth of the pixels that we're coloring in to determine whether they are close to something and intersecting or somewhere up here, maybe right in the middle of Ferris's head, not even close to each other, you know? And then there's some math here for doing things like how intense should these colors be? For example, if I throw in some arbitrary numbers here, the output looks different. This is especially on the backside, the number that I'm changing right now. So you'll see the backside get kind of faded out a little bit as opposed to two or as opposed to like 0 0.02 will make it really intense. So a lot of these numbers are kind of arbitrary, like 100 is arbitrary, two is kind of arbitrary. And the core of this is that we're detecting how close these two pixels are together using the depth of the texture that we've painted using all of the like physical materials, we'll call them, compared to the depth of the current alpha texture that we're trying to draw. So some position on this sphere compared to some position in the depth buffer. And other than that, it's basically just a bunch of math, a bunch of different calculations. Um, I've covered the Fresnel effect and things like that in other videos, so I won't do that again. I've covered simplex noise before. One really nice thing is that we're using globals.time now instead of needing to pass the time into the texture. Really happy about that. Love that. And that's really it. The only other thing is that I needed to do a slightly different calculation for the front of the mesh versus the back of the mesh. So you see when I modified this number here, we got that faded back look or when I added it here, uh, we got like a very intense look, but the look is only on the back of the sphere, like the, the, mm, or the fragments that we're looking at the back of. That's why we have is front here. And is front is something that Bevy just passes in for us. It's something that's in the WGSL spec, similar to position is in the WGSL spec and so on. That's why these are built-ins. <laughs> so that's it. And then it's just like choosing arbitrary numbers. In this case, I'm multiplying for now by like 0 0.4, but like if that was 40, it'll change it, right? It'll be really intense if it's times 40 as you can see on the left uh, but you can see a little bit of noise in here and that's coming from the simplex noise here which i am the noise gives us like negative one to one i'm raising that from zero to two then dividing by two so it gives us from zero to one the highlight is the band that's going around here and so on and so forth and any numbers that are too big uh like we were just seeing with the fresnel will produce more bloom more light or look like they should be lit um and the and yeah other than that the whole effect is that intersection number right for this intersection with the floor plane and this intersection with the wall plane combined with the fresnel which is the edge of the circle and then some other noise and some other things that i kind of just wanted to include but yeah this was kind of a less of a tutorial and more of a hey i figured something out it's kind of cool um i hope this helped you if you're working with shaders and if you have any questions leave them in the comments happy to answer them link to the code also in the comments and i will see you in the next video have a great rest of your day